We'd especially like to uh, greet our guests and our online visitors. My name is Nayaswami Bharat, and this is Nayaswami Anandi. And I'll be reading from Ways of the One Light. And this week's reading is, Who is this Son of Man? <clears throat> Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. On Palm Sunday, the throng joyfully acclaimed Jesus Christ as he entered Jerusalem, casting palm fronds before him and singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord bless the King of Israel. Jesus Christ had told the people, the Son of Man must be lifted up. His reference, so we are told, was to the mode of his impending crucifixion. Some persons on that occasion had asked, who is this son of man? Was Jesus a human being merely? Those who on, on Palm Sunday called him king little realized the actual nature of his kingdom. He was far more than what they imagined. Yes, of course, he ate, drank, walked, slept, and talked with others, like others. His consciousness, however, was centered in infinity. Yes, again, he laughed like others, but his laughter expressed divine joy, not mere merriment. Again, he wept like them, but never with human grief. The tears he shed were for the suffering of unenlightened human beings. Never were they shed in self-pity. Jesus Christ was wakeful in God. Most people, by contrast, are asleep spiritually. How strange to reflect that less than a week from that entry into Jerusalem, so joyfully acclaimed, he would be arrested, condemned, and crucified. Such is the bitter sweetness of human existence. Smiles of welcome one day, insults, even persecution the next. How few realize that Christ's suffering would not be for himself, but for people's ignorance, for those who had not yet understood the deeper reality that dwelt also in them. Everyone is born trailing clouds of glory, as the poet Wordsworth put it. Even the meanest beggar has lived a story, or will eventually have lived it, more magnificent than the greatest epic ever written. In the Bhagavad Gita, this dichotomy between the Son of Man and the inner Son of God is beautifully described. Sri Krishna, representing God in human form, reveals his true nature in infinity. In the 11th chapter of that great scripture, his chief disciple Arjuna exclaims, O oh, infinite light, thy radiance spreading over the universe shines into the very darkest abyss. Thy voice overwhelms a roar of cosmic cataclysms. Lo, the my myriad stars are thy diadem. Thy scepter radiates power everywhere. O oh, immortal Brahman, Lord of all, again and again at thy feet of infinity, I lie in prostration before thee. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om. 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 Uh, I'd like to begin by reading uh, from a book of prayers and poems by Paramahansa Yogananda called Whispers from Eternity. I take this sacred vow. Never will I lower my love's gaze below the eyebrow horizon of my constant thoughts of thee. Never will I turn my uplifted inner sight away from thee. Never will I let my mind dwell on anything that reminds me not of thee. I will court all dreams of noble achievement, those of love, kindness, and understanding, for they are thy dreams. Thy grace has shown me that the dualities of health and sickness, life and death, 
joy and sorrow are but passing fantasies. I am persuaded at last that there is but one abiding reality, thy eternal, ever conscious, ever new, ever thrilling, infinite bliss. Well, that's an appropriate prayer for Palm Sunday. <clears throat> Yogananda said that when a soul becomes supremely free of all need to return back to this world, all karmic uh, involvements, that God asks some of them to come back as avatars, as messengers to help other souls to become free. And each one of them has been given a, a special assignment, something that they need to bring to teach. They're all one, they're all equal, they all have the same connection with God's bliss, and yet one has to come as Buddha, another as Krishna. And um, today uh, we're talking about Jesus Christ. And so God crafts the life of all these masters. But when he crafted the life of Jesus Christ, I think he really extended his creative abilities as a playwright because this has been, it has really been called the greatest story ever told. And really, just think about the, the, the beginning of Jesus's life, how dramatic, you know, people trying to kill him, born in a manger, angels filling the sky. I mean, so picturesque, so dramatic. And then coming to the end of his life, again, tremendous drama, glorious finale. Uh, has there ever been a greater ending written, a surprise ending? Just, just magnificent. And this day of Palm Sunday, just a beautiful plot twist in the middle that... Here Jesus comes and the crowds are yelling uh, blessings, adoration. Hosanna is just saying, we, we welcome you. You're our king. We think you've come to help us. You're going to change our lives for the better. We're so happy to see you. And just this great, great joy. We heard the song from the oratorio this morning, sung magnificently by the choir, um, singing out Hosanna. And there's a song before it. This is from a piece of music Swami wrote about the life of Christ. And his whole life is expressed in music. And right before Sing Out Hosanna is a, a very beautiful duet. And the lines are um, kind of to preview Palm Sunday. And the lines go, how few in that music could detect the sad note of approaching disaster, human destiny wrote. So here the crowd is cheering, thro throwing palm fronds. Five days later, they're asking for Christ's crucifixion. They hate him. Li I like you. I hate you. This is wonderful. I want it. I don't want it. All this back and forth and back and forth. And in the middle of it all, knowing the whole story. Christ knew exactly what would happen in his life before he came. In the middle, he walks through it all. The crowds are cheering. He's centered in God. He's doing the will of his Father. The cheering, he, he rejoices in their happiness, but he knows where it's going. They take him to be crucified. He's in his center. He's with God. He's doing the will of his father. He doesn't change. And Yogananda and the Indian teachings look at all great scriptures, not, oh, this was a historical story of a great saint, but Christ was also living us. This, this whole story of Christ is represented within us. And Jesus was the Christ, the anointed of God. His consciousness was fully centered here. So on the one hand, Bharat wrote, Christ the Son of Man. Yes, he had a human life and he did things, but he was 
the Son of God. He was living in God consciousness here. And in that consciousness, that's what he represents in this story. In our life, we have the Christ consciousness within us. We have that right now. It's just waiting to awaken. We're working hard to awaken it. And then we have the crowds. Oh, we love you. Oh, we hate you. We know those crowds too, don't we? They're sort of familiar. They're the reactive process in our own consciousness. Oh, this is so wonderful. Oh, I hope this happens. Oh, not that. Oh, I hope that doesn't happen. And it's back and forth and back and forth. And we have opinions about this being good and that being bad. And yet, within us, we have that still place, that Christ consciousness. And so that is the message of Palm Sunday. How can we stay connected to the Christ? St. John um, of the Cross said, live in this world as if only you and God exist. What did he mean by that? He didn't mean keep your eyes closed and push other people out of the way. He meant stay connected to God and see that everything that comes to you in life, the people who think you're the greatest, the people who sneer at you, the people who look at you disdainfully, it's all God coming to you. Why? To help you move toward a greater realization of your potential. That's what life is about. How can you discover who you really are? It may be through praise, it may be through blame, but that is the goal. So we're trying to tune into that, that everything and everyone that comes to us, it's all from God. So when we look at our life, everything that comes to us, we stub our toe, we win the lottery, people hate us, it doesn't, all these things, there, there are different ways we can react. We can decide, you know, when, when things are going well, when your meditations are going well, your body feels good, people are liking you, you never say, why is this happening? You, <laughs> you just go, this is great. This is the way life should be, you know? But when your meditations are dry and restless and your body is sick and people don't like you, you just say, why? Why? And so there's three different ways we can look at those times. Those are the times we ask the question. One is we can, we can blame. We can say, well, this isn't right. You know, I must not be in tune. That's why I can't meditate. So we blame ourselves. They are not very intelligent. That's why they don't appreciate me. We, bl <laughs> we blame others. You know, this should not be happening to me. So that's one. This shouldn't be happening. The other is we blame God. And I, I don't know about you, but I have met lots of people who've said to me, I must be a very bad person to have all these things happen to me. It's, it's very sad, you know, I must have done terrible things in my past life to have all this come to me. And that's not a useful way to look at things either, okay? Blame is not useful. Um, deciding that God is, reven is revenging himself on you for your evil behavior, that's not useful either. But the other is to say, everything that comes to me is attracted to me by my own soul, by God within me. I am drawing these lessons, not for my harm, not for my punishment, but that I may go more deeply into myself, that I may learn more about my potential, that I may grow in love, that I may grow in inner strength. All of this is for me. Lately, I've been really trying to tune into this last approach, which is obviously the one that we recommend here. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and to realize, you know, there are people in your life that just, they just rub you the wrong way, or maybe they do more than rub you the wrong way. Maybe they insult you, maybe they dislike you. There are circumstances that come to you that just are awful, or they may be confusing or painful or whatever, but always, 
It's something inside of ourselves. Why did this person annoy me? Why did this circumstance upset me so much? There's some hook right here. It's not about them. It has nothing to do with them. They may be an agent, but look around you. There's hundreds of people in your life. Why does that one upset you? Why does this event in your life stick in your mind with all the other events? There's something inside that is hooking on to that. And we can tune into that. And if we can actually not get into analyzing why that person is really dumb for saying that to us, but say, okay, what, what in me? Why? Why am I holding on to this? And go deep inside of ourselves and own it and say, okay, I'm ready, God. I want to know. Show me what this is about. I release this into your hands. Last night, I happened to be reading um, The Essence of the Bhagavad Gita, which is Yogananda's interpretation written by Swami Kriyananda. And in chapter uh, 15 of the book, he's, he writes about pain. And Swami, over the years, is sort of notorious for going to the dentist, even for the worst, worst dental surgery and, and not taking Novocaine. And, but he's writing about pain, but he's writing about, there's a lot of kinds of pain. There's dental pain, which is a lot, but then there's also other pain. And he said, when you feel pain, whether it's emotional or whatever, try to really relax deeper and deeper into the heart of that pain. Go so deep into it. Usually we're pushing it away, pushing it away. But to try to relax so deeply into it that we can release it from inside of ourselves. This is something really to think about and to see if, if we can incorporate it into our lives. There was a young man who, who wrote up uh, some of his experiences with one, with one of Yogananda's very highly advanced uh, disciples. He began to go to her for counseling sometime, I think, in the 60s. And so he, he saw her, they knew each other fairly well. He came to her regularly. And one time, and he's, he was a devil, he was a disciple of Yogananda, and he was, you know, doing his best to be on the spiritual path. And so he came to her this time and he said, you know, I'm having this physical problem. And he said, I, I really resent it. I didn't, I'm doing everything right. I don't earn, I didn't deserve this. I don't own, you know, this is not, this is wrong, and I resent having it. And she just looked at him and she said, oh, you resent it, do you? She said, this is very important. She said, when you resent something, you do not pay the karma for it. In other words, there's a lesson coming to you from everything that comes your way. When you resent it, you're essentially saying, no, I'm not paying the karma on this. And what happens? It comes back again and again because you haven't freed it. You haven't freed yourself from it. So it will keep coming to you until you can accept it gratefully, willingly. It's a powerful thing to think about because I'm sure we've all um, uh, erred on the other side. So just to say, okay, if this is coming to me, my assignment is to be able to accept it, to know that it's mine, and to be glad that I'm getting the opportunity to complete it. Swami Kriyananda once explained karma in a very beautiful way. He said that when we act, however we act, whatever we're doing all the time, we're creating karma, everything we do, uh, we initiate a half circle by our action and by our attitude behind the action. If it was a generous action, that was one kind of energy. If it was a selfish action, it was another kind of energy. And that half circle must be completed in the way it was initiated. So whatever we've put out will come back to us. And that energy rests inside of ourselves. It waits inside of ourselves. And why is that? It's a form of exquisite torture or something? No. We don't learn otherwise. 
As Yogananda said in class, sitting here in Sunday service, we're all angels. I talk about this stuff, you listen to this stuff, we all go, absolutely, I, I totally believe this. But when it comes to the moment, and we're face to face with something that's painful or confusing or whatever, we don't always remember it. So we have to learn from our experience. We can't just think we understand it. We learn from our experience. So those lessons come back to us out of love. We need to learn the lesson, and God's love sends it to us so we will be free. So trying to tune into that. Yogananda said something fascinating about karma. He said, when you look at your life, pay attention to what you emphasize about your life in your mind. Do you think to yourself, oh, I've made so many mistakes? Do you think to yourself, people have really treated me poorly in my life. I've never been, you know, I've never fully received the recognition I deserve, or whatever it is. Do you see the negative, or do you see the positive? And to the extent that we see the negative, we attract it again. Interesting. Which doesn't seem very good. But what he said is you can change your karma right now. So if you have a tendency to look at your life in a negative way, and to emphasize, you know, oh, I've made so many mistakes. Look at it in a different way. Say, and this is true, and this is what Yogananda told us to know and to affirm, God has been living this life through me. Everything has been done through me. God is the doer. All those mistakes I made, they've helped to bring me to the point where I want to be a better person. I long to be perfect. I long to be more kind. I long to be more generous. Whatever it is that we've, however we've made the mistake, it really impels us forward. So try to see, okay, that was a dream happening in this life. God was playing the role of Anandi or Ganesha or whoever, doing what needed to happen to help my soul move forward. And I won't look at it as a, I did it. It was done. God did it through me. So we're trying to get into the positive flow. We, um, there was a wonderful article that just was written by uh, our minister, one of our ministers in Los Angeles, uh, Dharma Devi. It was so sweet. She said that in the, um, she's the minister for our Los Angeles group, and she said, I'm surprised how often people come to me and say, I don't like so-and-so in the congregation. <laughs> and then they'll say, do I have to love everyone? <laughs> and she, the answer she gave, some of us in the audience will recognize what she did. I won't go, I won't go into it, but she, she sort of retold an example that Swami gave. And so they say to her, do I need to love everyone? And she said, no, you do not need to love everyone. However, if you want to find God, you do need to love everyone. <laughs> so we want to understand that. Whoever has done whatever to us, we've got to be able to see God in that person if we want to know God. So how can we do that? Um, a friend of mine, what was it? Oh, I know what I was going to say, Dana. Um, Dana Anderson, many of us know her. She's a really great artist who lives in our Itali Italy community. And she um, had a commission for a big painting. And it was very helpful because she's a single mother and she needed that income. And then the commission fell through. And she was a little concerned about that and upset about that. And then she thought to herself, if this were a blessing, what would the blessing be? She took the karma and she adjusted it. And she found that instead of being very, very concerned, she began to list blessing after blessing after blessing, and she was filled with joy. 
Isn't that beautiful? So just one way is to just change our approach to looking at who's out there, why they're out there, why they're doing what they're doing to you. What is the blessing here? A woman came here as a guest recently, and she said to me, she told me about some things that had happened in her workplace where she felt like she was being taken advantage of financially by another person. Not a good energy, been going on for years. And I really was at a loss as to what to tell her. And in praying about it, um, I said, why don't you say to yourself, because it was very difficult, she didn't know what to do, she was sort of boxed in. I said, why don't you begin to pray, God is stronger than this test. God is stronger than this test. And she called me two days later. This had been going on for years, this this friction. She called me two days later and she said, this person in my office knocked on my door the other day and she said, I think I've been mistreating you. I'd like to work with you in a different way. Just from changing her internal approach, instead of feeling like, oh, why me? God can handle this. God can handle this. And finally, um, Swami Kriyananda, uh, a friend told this story. One of our Ananda ministers went with Swami Kriyananda to dinner at some people's home. These people were friends of Ananda, not really seriously relate, uh, connected to Ananda. And they had an evening there. And when they were leaving the evening, this minister said to Swami, that was a really uncomfortable evening. The way those people treated you was really disrespectful. I, I felt really bad for you about how you were being treated. Swami looked at him and said, really? I didn't notice a thing. <laughs> and then, the way Swami told it, he said, I realized that I hadn't been thinking about what was coming to me. I had only been thinking, how can I help these people? What do they need to hear? What was coming his way was unimportant. So, looking for the blessing. Where's the blessing in this situation? Knowing that God is stronger than whatever can come your way. And looking for how, instead of, oh, what am I getting? What can I give? So, I'd like to close by sharing with you something that I want to give us a chance to do together. Um, some of us in the room may, may have been at this class. We had a class for new members uh, a few weeks ago. And again, we were studying the Bhagavad Gita, and we were reading um, chapter, uh, I, I think it stands of 15.5, no, 5.15, anyway. Um, yeah, you said 5.15. 5.15, okay, so what it says in there, uh, Swami writes that we want to, we can attune to other people from our own center. And what we did was very interesting. We, we went into our center in the spine. I said, forget about who you are. Forget about your body, your age, your gender, your profession, your worries, anything about yourself. Just go into this place inside yourself that is timeless, that is immortal. That's your center. And Swami says, from there we can tune into historical personages. So we didn't we didn't tune into any of our line of masters or to Swami. We tuned into George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and um, Nelson Mandela, and everybody did their own thing. And and afterwards, we were really quite stunned by the experience. It was amazing to to realize you could actually feel something of the consciousness of this person. Well, naturally, the way to do that that is much more inspiring is to tune into the masters, tune into Jesus, tune into Yogananda. Now they, they operate, their center is everywhere. They are not centered in a human, in a personage, a historical personage. Their center is actually right inside of you. They're omnipresent. That's the definition of a master. 
So practice this, and we're going to end by doing this for just a few moments, to just close your eyes now. <coughs> Sit up straight. And just relax inside yourself. And just let everything drop away that has any temporal aspect. And tune into your center and feel your connection there with your own highest self, your own deepest self. And feel as if you can also tune in there. You can tune to Jesus if that is your path. You can tune to Master if that is your path. And just feel your connection with that presence. Though fallen deep in sin, 